Okay, so we're gonna have a review lesson today. This is gonna be on de Broglie wavelength, isotopes and mass spectrometers. Uh, it's gonna be another one of those you try, I go over kind of uh, days today, unless you're really stuck with some of this, in, in which case I guess you can just watch uh, as I go through some of these questions. Uh, two of these questions, the first one and the last one are gonna be a little harder hitting than usual. Um, again, all of this material is pretty obscure, um, but if you need any help, make sure you're reaching out to me because uh, this stuff does get kind of bizarre. Um, once you get the hang of it, it's, it's not horrible. Like I honestly still think uh, forces and fields is probably uh, a harder unit than this one, but that's just my opinion. Let's get going. So we're gonna run through a selection of questions. It's only gonna be three questions today. There's gonna be one on de Broglie wavelength. There's gonna be one on uh, uh, isotopes, and then there's gonna be one on mass spectrometers. Uh, that's all we've really done, but it's, uh, it's pretty complex stuff here. So in other words, I, I think we really need some practice here. Anyway, first question. This is similar to one that was in your book. Here we go. Uh, so in a, re a recreation of the Frank Hertz experiment, uh, an electron with 9.70 electron volts of energy collides with a mercury atom. Determine the speed of this electron after the collision. So I give you an energy level diagram for mercury atoms. Uh, we'll assume that this mercury atom initially had its electrons in its total like stable bottom rest state. Uh, I want you to find the speed of the electron that struck this mercury atom uh, after the collision. So I'll give you a hint, you will need to use this chart. Give it a try. All right, so I'm gonna go over this one now. This one is pretty obscure. I never did one like this in uh, any lesson, um, but hopefully you'd, you'd be able to put things uh, together based on what I talked about. One thing I did talk about was how uh, at certain levels of energy, that's where you start getting uh, basically electrons to move to different levels. Uh, so if we're assuming that the electron in the mercury atom was initially at a full rest state, uh, when an electron strikes this, it acts kind of like a photon in which where it can actually provide energy to it uh, and charge it. Now, what you need to see here, however, is this electron has 9.70 electron volts of energy. The bottom rest state here is 10.4 electron volts. So if we go 10.4 and we add 9.70 to this, um, or sorry, negative 10.4, and we add 9.70 to this, you're going to find we're at negative 0.70 electron volts, which according to our diagram would be about right here somewhere, right? Negative 0.70. Uh, however, there isn't an energy level there, right? The nearest energy level is this one down here. So imagine, if you will, that the energy that's passed to this mercury atom wants to bring it up to here, but there's nothing there, so it has to actually stop at this one down here. So in reality, the amount of energy that's being given to this mercury atom uh, is just this difference right here. Uh, now, this difference right here, you don't actually need to know it because, again, we're not interested in that piece. We're, one, we're interested, however, in the amount of energy that the electron has after the collision, which is just this leftover amount right here. So this leftover amount from where it actually took the mercury atom to what's actually left over, that's what's left over in that electron that's bounced off this mercury atom and is still doing its own thing. Uh, to find that, of course, you just have to go negative 1.6 and subtract the negative 0 0.70. So just find the difference between those two. Uh, personally, I just like making it a positive number, so I'm gonna make it 0 0.90 electron volts. That is how much energy is left over in the electron after it has collided with this mercury atom, because the remaining amount of energy, because originally it had 9.70 electron volts, that remaining amount of energy had been given to the mercury atom. There's just a little bit left over. If it had a full 10.4 electron volts, it would have had no uh, energy left over. It would have been completely absorbed uh, by this mercury atom. But anyway, there is some left over because we uh, there isn't a step in between here. Hopefully that makes some sense. Now that right there, again, that's the energy of our electron, okay? But energy in electron volts is a little bit of a weird thing to use unless we're just exclusively dealing with it. Since we're looking for the speed, that's kind of indicating that we're gonna be using kinetic energy, which is one half mv squared. Uh, and kinetic energy requires us to use joules. So first things first, I'm gonna change that 0 0.90 electron volts into joules. And to do that, the conversion is on your formula sheet. It's 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19. And that gives me 1.44 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. So that right there, that's how much joules is in 0 0.90 electron volts. So again, this is our energy. We're looking for our speed that's gonna come out of our kinetic energy formula. So we can say 1.44 times 10 to the negative 19 equals one half mv squared. Well, m of an electron is 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31. That's also on your formula sheet, of course. V is what we're looking for, so it's v squared. Uh, to do this, just multiply by, 
or divide by one half, I guess, or multiply by two, I suppose you could do. Uh, so divide away the one half, divide away the 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31, and then square root it. I got as a final answer here, V is equal to 5.62 times 10 to the five meters per second. There we go. Uh, so again, there is a question very much like this in your, uh, in your atomic physics worksheet. Um, I think I used a hydrogen atom instead of a mercury one. I can't, I can't remember what was exactly in there, but uh, same general idea, just understand that only certain intervals of energy can actually be absorbed. So there's some leftover in this case that you have to kind of find. And drawing a picture really helps. At least it helps for me. I think that was a better visual. The one on the left, of course, is showing ideally where it would go. There's no bar here though, so it can't actually hit there. It hits here instead, and then that's the leftover. That's what you were interested in. Anyway, moving on. All right, next one. This one uh, is a little simpler, but uh, really interesting nonetheless. Isotopes. Uh, americium, I think is how you pronounce that. Uh, the chemical symbol for that is AM, is an artificial element, meaning it doesn't exist in nature. Nowhere, nowhere in nature does this thing naturally exist, at least not that we found, at least not on Earth. Uh, but it has been created in laboratories by scientists, and it's actually a byproduct of nuclear reactors. Kind of interesting. Uh, there are many isotopes of americium, uh, none of which are stable. It's also used in household smoke detectors. This is actually news to me. I didn't know this, and believe me, I'll tell you a story in just a second here. Uh, in household smoke detectors, there's a little bit of this stuff. So products of a nuclear reactor, uh, just in very small quantities, which is about 0 0.29 micrograms, so very, very little. Apparently, if you took apart a smoke detector, there's like a little capsule in there that has a radioactive sign on it. Yeah, this is serious business right there. That's what that is. Uh, now, determine the number of protons and neutrons found in the nucleus of an atom of americium 241, right? So this is what you're really focusing in on. You will need to use your periodic table on your formula sheet. Give this one a try. All right, so I'm gonna go over this one. Uh, honestly, I think maybe, maybe this is a bit of a flex. For me, the hardest part was finding this on the formula sheet. Uh, it's way down at the bottom, kind of in the middle. Uh, you'll find that when you find americium, AM is the symbol. Uh, we know this right here in this notation, that's gonna be your atomic mass number. So I'll put that up top. 241, uh, and then your atomic number, which is your number of protons, is inherent to any given element. And for a americium, it is always 95, as you would find on your formula sheet. So that's really what you needed to find uh, on that periodic table there. Uh, so interpreting this, this tells us we, of course, have 95 protons. By definition, if something has 95 protons, it is a americium. Uh, but then in terms of your neutrons, this is where you have to do a little bit of very basic math. Uh, remember the 241 represents all of the nucleons, which is your protons and neutrons combined. So to find just your neutrons, you just take 241 and take away the protons, and that gives you 146. So then you have 146 neutrons. That right there, that is your answer. That's all there is to it. Now, story time. I bet you guys have missed story time from all this. Uh, when I was making this slide, I was like, oh, you know, I'm just picking whatever, just any kind of radioactive isotope I can find. Uh, and I just chose this one because it, it kind of sounded interesting. But then I was like looking some stuff up on this. First of all, I found out that it was in household smoke detectors. I did not know that, but that is kind of crazy. But then I found something even in uh, more interesting. Uh, and I can't believe I've never heard this before. Maybe some of you guys have. Uh, in the 1990s, there was a Boy Scout in the United States who uh, had a pretty interesting hobby with all of this. Uh, his name was David, David Hahn was his name. Uh, and this guy, uh, again, he was a Boy Scout. He was like 17 years old. What he would do is he'd go and find a bunch of discarded smoke detectors. Like he'd, he'd just go get them from places and then he would take them apart and get the americium out of them and store it in larger quantities. What he was able to do was he was able to make something called a neutron source, which is basically like on the way to making his own nuclear reactor. And he's doing this like in, the, in his like mom's backyard shed. Like this, this guy made like a, almost a nuclear reactor just at home using a bunch of smoke detectors. Total disclaimer, I do not authorize you guys to do that. It is illegal, but holy smokes, like who would even come up? And like, how, how at the age of 17, would you figure that kind of thing out? Um, anyway, this David Hahn guy, I looked up his whole story. He's had a very tragic life story. He actually passed away just a few years ago. Um, so yeah, he, he had a pretty, pretty rough, messed up life here, but still like taking apart smoke detectors or something like that, that's just crazy. Yeah, like the FBI was after him and everything like that. Holy smokes, crazy. All right, anyway, mass spectrometers. Uh, a basic mass spectrometer uses a four-stage process. Uh, the reason I'm going back over this is, of course, because I think it's a little bit confusing how these things work. Uh, so a, a mass spectrometer, remember, ultimately what it does is it organizes things based on isotopes. 
the first thing is it ionizes things where it vaporizes and ionizes them, so it gives them a charge. Then it accelerates them using high voltage plates. Then the really important ones here, the velocity selection phase, so it passes through perpendicular electric and magnetic fields, so only things at a specific velocity pass through. If they're going too slow, they go one way. If they're going too fast, they go another way. If they're going like right in that Goldilocks zone, they'll go just right. Uh, the last one is detection. Uh, current detected in detector chamber where ions move in uh, circular paths and can be measured. So then there's a detection chamber, they watch them swirl around, uh, and then you can measure what kind of isotope it was, okay? These two though, these two phases right here, those are important, okay? In this velocity selection phase, you just need to know Fe equals Fm, very important. In the detection phase, we know Fm is equal to Fc because it's moving in a circular path. Really important to understand. All right, so here's a question. A singly charged carbon ion travels through the detection chamber where your magnetic field strength is 300 uh, milliteslas of a mass spectrometer with a circular path of radius 11.3 centimeters. If the velocity selector, this is the earlier step, is composed of an electric field with this strength and a magnetic field with this strength uh, perpendicular to each other, what is the mass number of the carbon isotope? So in other words, what is the atomic mass of this isotope of carbon? Uh, it'll just be a whole number. Uh, another thing I'll just mention on this one, it's weird how the magnetic field strength in this is the same as this. It doesn't have to be that way. That's just a coincidence. Um, but please pause the video here, give it a try, and I'll go over it in just a second. All right, so I'm going to go over this one now. Uh, I kind of was giving you a hint earlier when I said this is the first phase. Uh, you need to start with that, right? Because this phase, the velocity selector, as the name kind of tells you, uh, is going to tell you what the velocity was, how fast this thing was going. Now, velocity selector phase, we know Fe equals Fm. Uh, and if you write out the formulas for that, you'd see it's EQ equals QVB. And I guess I should put arrows on the top of those. Uh, but when you have this formula written out, you can see that the Qs are going to cancel each other out. Not that it matters because we know it was singly charged anyway. That's just 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19. Uh, but bottom line is you can isolate your velocity by saying velocity is your electric field strength divided by your magnetic field strength. So not too hard actually to find that. So electric field strength uh, was 7.50 times 10 to the 4. And your magnetic field strength is 300 milliteslas, so in other words, 0 0.300 teslas. Uh, throw that in the calculator, and you're going to find that your velocity was a very nice, even number here, 250,000 meters per second. Okay, so that was the velocity as it's entering the next step, which is the detection chamber. So moving on to the detection chamber, the detection chamber works by putting it into a circular path. So that tells you that your Fm is equal to your Fc. Writing out the formulas for those, we know it's QVB, that's your FM, equals FC, which is MV squared over R. Notice there's velocity on both sides of this formula, so we'll knock out this velocity and we'll knock out one of these ones. So QB equals MV over R. We're looking for the mass number. The mass number, again, is not the same thing as the mass. You have to go one step further than that, but at least you should start by finding the mass. So I'm going to try to get my mass all by myself here, or all by itself here. Uh, so I'll times by R and then I'll divide by V. Uh, this is going to give me mass is equal to QBR divided by V. We know Q because it was singly charged. That's 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19. We know B it was given to us right, well, actually technically it was this one right here. Same idea though. Uh, and we know R it was given to us here. And we know velocity we found it in the last step. So let's just throw all this in here. I'm going to move over on the far left side here just so I have some more room. Mass is equal to 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 times by B, which is 0 0.300, times by R, which is 0 0.113, you gotta turn that into meters, of course, divided by your velocity, which is 250,000. If you throw that in your calculator, you're gonna find that you get 2.1696 times 10 to the negative 26 kilograms. That is the mass of your carbon isotope. But that's not the mass number. Remember, the mass number tells you just how many nucleons are in that isotope. So what we should do to figure out how many nucleons are in that isotope, we should just divide by the mass of a nucleon. Uh, the mass of a nucleon is the mass of a proton or a neutron, uh, which on your formula sheet is actually listed the same number. Let's divide this now by 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27. Because again, that's the mass of either a proton or a neutron. Uh, throw this in your calculator, it's gonna give you like 12.99. I'm just gonna round it up. We can say there's 13 uh, nucleons, or in other words, your mass number is going to be 13. That was a pretty tough one. I think I might have actually taken this one directly out of your, uh, your atomic physics booklet, um, but still really important to know. You have to know how a mass spectrometer works. 
Uh, so for practice, make sure you've completed the practice worksheets uh, assigned up until now. Uh, remember those worksheet solutions, including all of the work, are found on Google Classroom. So the, in the Atomic Physics workbook, with the, the worksheet solutions with all the worked out solution answers, everything, that's actually on Google Classroom. So make sure you're using that to check your work. Uh, another thing you can do for practice, I didn't write it on here though, is of course that Atomic Physics assignment. I know it's not due for, uh, for a little while still, but might be might be worthwhile to start picking away at that. Anyway, as always, if you need any help, please let me know.